welcome everyone. <laughs> I'm uh, particularly excited uh, today to introduce this very special program. My name is Hugh Siegel, I'm curator of the Wind and Music. And um, yeah, as you undoubtedly know, for a long time the Cold War has been presented in terms of this East-West conflict. But um, that would assume that the rest of the world either was somehow part of the East or the West or didn't really matter in history, in politics. So around uh, 25 years ago, historians started to realize that life is more complex and more layered than that. And they started to uh, approach Cold War history in a more global uh, perspective. And actually, uh, the publications of our guest speaker have contributed to that new awareness. Also, many people uh, during the past few years um, have uh, talked about a new Cold War, given the tensions between the West and Russia, the West and China. And uh, again, in order to really understand the complexity of our global society, it makes a lot of sense not just to focus on this uh, bipolar model of uh, political analysis, but have an open eye for the global implications and the global dynamics. And I think that the growing popularity of world history has uh, aided a lot in allowing us to have a more well-rounded view of history. I'm particularly um, happy today that we are joined by George Chatterjee, Professor of History at Cal State University, Los Angeles. Joy is not only an eminent scholar, but also a very dear personal friend. I want, uh, before I give her the floor, to mention a few publications, which uh, give a sense of the broadness and um, impact of her work. Um, she wrote a book, uh, Celebrating Women, Gender, Festival Culture, and Bolshevik Ideology, 1910-1939, as well as Russia in World History, a Transnational Approach, which uh, appeared last year. Then she co-wrote two other books, The 20th Century, A Retrospective, and Russia in the Long 20th Century, Contested Voices, Memories, and Perspectives. And then I also wanted to uh, mention the three titles of her edited volumes. The Russian Experience, Americans Encountering the Enigma, 1890 to the Present, Everyday Life in Russia, Past and Present, and the global impacts of Russia's great war and revolution. Um, it's a really uh, ple real pleasure to um, have Choi with us today. I should also mention, by the way, that she is a very avid um, environmentalist. And um, if you would visit her home and her garden, you will encounter a little paradise. <laughs> Choi, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Yush, for overly kind introduction, and thank you for being here on this cold and rainy September afternoon in Los Angeles. I have not been here since 1994. I don't remember hurricanes and rain in September, so this is nice. Thank you for coming. I want to acknowledge my former graduate student, Miguel Ariola, who is legally blind, and without his help, I would not have understood the military dimensions of the war. So Miguel sends me texts every day, voice recorded, and I am able to follow the war because of him. So I really, really want to thank him. He has a uh, Substack page coming up, and so if you all want to follow him, um, it is quite remarkable. So uh, this research project started last January. Um, I'm a historian. I rarely talk about contemporary events because that's not my speciality. But uh, in February, when Russia invaded Ukraine, um, it seemed that the whole world was united against this blatant uh, act. 190,000 troops were massed on the border for a while, and I was among the many who said, they'll never invade, you know, they're just bluffing. But when the invasion actually happened, it seemed that the whole world united 
to condemn the Russian aggression. So my husband and I were traveling to India and Pakistan in February, the, the week after the invasion. And we were on a Middle Eastern flight and we, and we were wondering where the plane would go over because the Russian airspace was closed. The first thing we realized was uh, Emirates was allowed to fly over Russian airspace, which I thought, we thought was very odd. We let it go. So we landed in Calcutta, a very lefty city in, in India, and of course all my friends, journalists, professors, nobody condemned the Russian aggression on Ukraine. In fact, everybody said America started this war and it became an anti-American rant. So my husband and I were really surprised. We thought, you know, these are the old lefties, you know, they're so out of it. So then we went to Karachi, Pakistan, and every dinner we heard the same thing. Um, America started this war um, and Pakistan should do what India is doing and buy discounted oil from Russia. Um, after these three experiences, uh, I turned to Omar and said, this is a research project. Why would the global south, which struggled for decades, centuries, to free themselves from European colonialism, why would they take the side of a European imperial power against a post-colonial nation? The whole, none, none of it made any sense. So, it, so this talk is our answers, possible answers, to my own confusion. And I think part of the confusion was also because the Western media and the academic establishment of which I've been a proud member since 1988, seemed to only present it as a Russia and the West conflict. And all these other discordant voices that were challenging the narrative never made it through to the publications, and it's only since this April we are suddenly beginning to hear voices from the Global South. And Fiona Hill, if you all are interested, she gave a very good talk at the, uh, the Lemmert uh, Memorial Lecture. Now, I'm a historian, so I will go back a little bit to history, but not Russian history, but the way that Russian history has been studied, which I think has led us to this strange uh, place and time in the West where we simply have no idea what the rest of the world is thinking and why Russia has managed to cultivate such close friendships across the globe. And I feel a little bit embarrassed on behalf of Slavic and Russian studies to which I belong as how could we miss what three-fourths of the world was thinking, right? So I'm, I'm not coming here with knowledge, I'm coming here with deep humility of thinking about how can I better help my field. So, um, so I'm just going to go through a few of these, and I won't mention names, but typically the way that we have studied Russian history in the West, and pretty much um, American, British, uh, French, German knowledge of Russia is so deep that Russian scholars have typically relied on this information for their own history. But the way that we've studied Russia is a failed Western power, right? It was too Asiatic. They never got democracy. They had socialist modernity, not capitalist modernity, right? So it was like a pathological version of how the West sees itself, right? Democratic, capitalistic, human rights. The Soviet Union, however, had its own version of world history, right? So each side has a way to see the globe. And the Soviet version of world history was socialist modernity, right? State control of all industry, um, a very generous welfare state, the one-party system, and this is something that they tried to export throughout the Cold War, and that's what Yush was talking about, the reason why it was seen as a bipolar world till really the early 2000s, because countries had to take a side. I mean, most of the post-colonial nations were too poor to even dream of having their own foreign policy, and I know we had the non-alignment movement, but it was a bit of a joke. 
um, because India, Egypt, Indonesia, all the people who signed the Bandung um, uh, conference, they were just too poor and irrelevant, and so willy-nilly, they had to join a side. And this is what has changed, as I, as I will argue, in the last 25 years. Um, in my own recent work, I've tried to get away from this idea of looking at Russia as a failed other, which is the way we continue to study it in the West. And what I've tried to do is compare the Russian and the British empires. And saying if you look at what the British did in Asia and in Africa, it's not that different from what um, Russia was doing. But I add, end on a note that after uh, Britain lost its empire, it had its democratic society in place. Um, the Soviet Empire and now the Russian Empire seems still to be very far away from a democratic society. Finally, and this is what Yush is talking about, how can we encourage the writing of history? Um, and this is something that the Russians did very well, where we include the global south. And I know it's a horrible term. No one agrees on what the global south means. Anything non-Western is now lumped into the global south. But the global south is now very powerful. China is a near peer competitor of the United States. Um, their, um, their GDP might be lower, but their purchasing power parity might be higher than us, right? And you see all these articles, China's failing, China's failing. When you are an 18, 19 trillion dollar economy, that failure will take a very long time, right? Um, China is not, going to, is not going to go away. So the global south is sort of a strange term, and I, and I will unpack this as I go. But I think um, we definitely can't afford to ignore them as we have. Okay, I'm just going to summarize very quickly, because I feel like when we talk about the West and the rest, and that is what most of these things are called, very charming, the rest, I think it's also important that we have some unity about what we mean by the West, right? And some of you will challenge this, but I think it's always good to start at a place that we have a few principles in, in common, right? So I will just go through this, you know, since 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, a globalization, the people who love it, neoliberal <laughs> uh, capitalism for people who hate it, but everybody would agree that there was an expansion of the, what was called the rules-based liberal order, right? Um, all the institutions of the world, right, the major institutions, the IMF, the World Trade Organization, the World Economic Forum, the United Nations, all reflected what was called as the Washington Consensus, right? There was very little attention paid to any other ways of being, and even in 2008, the financial crisis, when the so-called G20 was created, even then the G20 was a nothing a institution because pretty much the West would give the G20 staff and they would agree, right? We, we saw the first change this year. I have that this beautiful term, Chin America, that Niall F uh, Ferguson um, came up with because the whole belief was that China would be the our cheap factory system, right? So the West would benefit indefinitely from cheap Chinese manufacturing and that they were the reason for the incredible prosperity of the Western world for the last 20 years, uh, 20, 25 years. And I have there these other cultural values that everyone seemed to agree on, which was the culture of individual rights. So nation, family, religious community, all of these were not important. What was important was the individual. Um, you know, for example, George Soros announced a few months ago he was going to donate a billion dollars to eradicate nationalism from the world, like it's, you know, typhus or malaria. Um, now, when you say these things, it's fine, but for people who are listening to it, it's something else, right? So something is getting lost in translation of some of the stuff that's being said. And finally, the green energy transition, which I won't get into, but this, but this was very much part of the WEF consensus. 
Now, what we knew in February 22, and this is where I worry about my field. My field didn't predict the collapse of the Soviet Union. I was there in 1991, uh, literally as it was collapsing, and we had not a clue. I mean, the U United States had these legions of scholars, legions of spies, and none of us knew that it was going to collapse so much. So when it collapsed, um, the Bush government was trying desperately to prevent it from collapsing till they got the nuclear warheads, some kind of accountability system. So I don't belong to a profession that has covered itself with glory. Um, I, the same thing happened in February 22, right? There was a handful of scholars uh, who were saying it's imminent, they're going to invade, they're going to invade. Most of us thought, no, Russia's bluffing, you know. They invaded Georgia, they invaded Crimea, um, but they're not going to invade Ukraine, right? So this is what we thought in February of last year. One, Russia is isolated and poor, right? Secondly, Putin is this terrible tyrant. No, but he has no social support at all. Nobody cares less for him. His whole reign is going to collapse like a house of cards. Um, and this is going to be the start of the new Soviet empire. Putin, of course, famously grew up in the Soviet Union. He was in Berlin. He's always lamented the collapse of Soviet, com not communism, of the Soviet empire. And many, many scholars said, oh, today they're going to take Ukraine. They're going to take Poland right after that. They already have their man in Belarus. There's nothing to prevent, and you know, Hungary, their buddy, Austria's their buddy. They're going to walk into the Baltic states and the Cold War starts all over again. So two things we didn't know. One is how poorly the Russian army was going to perform. Um, and I won't get into what Putin was, you don't invade a country of 40 million with 190,000 troops, right? So what he was thinking, that's also up for questioning. But pretty much, I think, all the scholars in my field would agree to these points of view. And it seems like we were wrong. Okay. Um, what we continue to believe, right? Two years, a uh, year and a half into the war, that you know the interests of the United States, EU, NATO, Ukraine are vitally intertwined. That this is a fight for democracy, and if we don't support Ukraine, then we will allow global democracy to collapse. This is a hybrid war, right? Um, all wars are hybrid wars, but we've never seen economic sanctions deployed on this scale. Because before we had economic sanctions on Iran, on Venezuela, well, the Venezuelan economy collapsed. Iranian economy is very, very sick. So we had a good record with our sanctions. Um, the sanctions on Russia haven't worked the way they're supposed to. And that brings into questions what are sanctions for? The technology bans, the cyber attacks, and the information campaigns, right? So this is also a social media war, and as I'm sure you've heard the joke, Ukraine is winning on Twitter, right? Or X, what is that called now? It's called X, right? So this is also a very sophisticated social media war. Many analysts in the West have said this is a cheap war. Right? And many, many American senators, including Mitt Romney most recently, he said, well, not a single American is dying, as if Ukrainian lives don't count. But this is a very cheap war. We've spent 30, 40, 50, 60, 110. I've seen the estimates all the way. But that's not a lot of money given that our yearly budget for the Pentagon is $860 billion, right? So if you're spending less than 10% to degrade one of our biggest enemies, some would say this is a cheap war. Um, and finally, the most important thing is nobody's talking about, is armies need to fight and weapons need to be tested on the battlefield. So this is not just a war of democracy and dictatorship, this is a war about latest missiles. I don't know how many of you saw the article on the hypersonic missiles in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. If you all haven't seen it, please read it. And this is where my student has been invaluable, telling me about, you know, 
how the tanks are performing, how the cruise missiles are performing, how the air defense systems are performing, drone technology is performing, and now this whole realm of warfare in hypersonic missiles, which itself, it is very frightening. Anyway. So then this comes back to my research question is, why have post-colonial nations? It seemed to be a no-brainer. Why would they support Russia over Ukraine? And why are they pushing for an immediate end to a war instead of the collapse of Russia, regime change in Russia? That's the language that we've heard. And one of the first things that I realized is that deep ignorance of Russian history in the global south. So all they know, and here I'm generalizing broadly, is that during the Cold War, the Soviet Union helped many, many post-colonial nations against European colonizers. So they have very little understanding of the Russian imperialism from the 17th century onwards. And that's a big thing. And it's something I think in the West we take it for granted, but everybody knows about Russia's empire. Not everybody knows about Russia's empire. So that's point number one. Now, I wanted to go a little bit into my research methodology, right? So how did I do this research? And these were some of the, um, Rus and Russia has deployed the most sophisticated messaging in the last 20, 25 years through these organizations. And this is one of the key reasons why they've been able to spread their idea of the multipolar world um, or multipolarity so effectively. And this is something that the Global South is responding to. So you know, these are the places that I spent a lot of time on. Um, the Valdai Club, RT.com, Russia Today, they have special editions for Brazil, for India, for South Africa, for China. Spend a little time looking at it. It is incredibly sophisticated, the kind of news that they are delivering to these countries, often news that these countries want to hear instead of you know, the lectures that the Global South usually gets from the, from the West, right? And, um, the other places, the, uh, the Gatchakov uh, Fund, very important, Russia beyond the uh, uh, headlines. And one thing that I haven't done research in, because I just can't go there, is Russian social media. Um, Telegram, and there are many other places, and I know there are people much better qualified than me who are doing research on that. What is Russia telling the global south? It seems like we don't know what Russia's telling the global south. And this is where my research comes in. So the predominant thing is Russia's telling the global south, we are all victims of the West. And uh, Ji Hun Lee, who's uh, my very brilliant colleague at, at uh, Sogang University in Korea, he uses the term victim, um, victimhood nationalism, and he looks at Korea, you know, who sees itself a victim of Japan, and Japan sees themselves a victim of the West, Russia has suddenly joined the globe. Russian imperial power has transformed itself into a victim of the West. The West is trying to destroy us, like it has destroyed many, many countries, and we are this huge fraternal alliance of victims, right? Um, but think of the sleight of hand of how you go from being an empire to being a victim, right? That's number one. The second thing, and this is very important to remember, when people keep saying it's the new Cold War, it's the new Cold War, it's not the new Cold War, at least not for Russia. And Jake Sullivan, Anthony Blinken gave a very important speech two days ago. Listen to it, and I think the USA is backing away from it very belatedly. This is not about with us or against us, which is what the Cold War paradigm was. This is about your nation first, multilateral alliances, which sometimes work, sometimes they don't, but just because you're my friend, you don't have to vote with me on every occasion. So this is a very open-ended relationship. You can support Russia when you want, you don't support Russia when you want, but this is a changing world order instead of this binary world order, 
right? And, and this is, I think, a very, and I, Anthony Blinken actually weirdly echoed some of these points in his speech. This flexibility, I think, is what is appealing to people in the global south. Henry, yes. Oh. Um, and I think this flexibility is what people want, right? I want to be able to, and I'm thinking of India. I can buy Russian oil at a discounted price, but I can also be part of the American quad, right? Now, the global south has never had this kind of flexibility in a very, very long time. And we would be uh, smart to pay attention to this reimagining multilateralism. Any of you heard the YouTube videos by John Mearsheimer, the politi yeah, yeah, political scientist? You know, and he's been very against the war, and his theory is you never want to get into a war where you have two great powers arrayed against you. And even if Russia's not a great power, they're a minor great power. And his point is if we're going to fight China, we want Russia on our side. And with all due uh, reverence to Mia Shaimar, who I really admire, I think he's missing the point again. It's not just about Russia, China, and America, and the Russians know that. And I think we are learning that belatedly, right? It is the middle powers, and when the middle powers aggregate, they can create a lot of, a lot of trouble. Okay, um, and this is where the deep, deep relationships that Russia has inherited in the global south from the Soviet Union, their fight against decolonization. Um, this history, and I just can't go into it, but this history is being written as we speak, where so many countries from around the world thought socialist modernity was doable, and it led to catastrophic results from India to Tanzania, but hey, the memories die hard. Um, the last 25 years of interventions haven't really helped our case. Um, I mean, I'm mean, thinking of Libya right now because of the disaster, um, um, Syria, Iraq, the war on terror, Afghanistan. I don't think we have a very good and clean record in the last few years, and this is what Russian propaganda is constantly affirming, right? Look at the Western intervention. These are warmongers. They won't let the world live in peace. Everywhere they bring trouble. So this is something that they can point to. And never mind the role that Russia played in Syria. Let's not get into that. But they have very effectively portrayed the West as a source of war and civil discord. Um, the last point, neoliberal globalization, which Russia has constantly critiqued, and many Western scholars have weirdly echoed Russian talking points. This is interesting, because many countries in the global south have done very well because of neoliberal globalization. China is case number one, India is case number two. So many of these countries have benefited from the Washington consensus, from access to American markets, to technology transfers, to the reorientation of the economies from socialism, failed socialist policies towards capitalism. Of course, there have been terrible devastation through this globalization, but on the whole, I would say the world has benefited enormously. So when Russia pushes on this, this is where the global south pushes back, right? Nobody is willing to cut their ties with the west because that is the biggest ace in the hole. Okay. Now, this is perhaps the strongest suit in Russia's hand. And this propaganda, and I'm going to go through it a little bit, has been enormously successful around the world, so much so you see the surge of the right in Europe, right? All the way from Sweden to Italy to Denmark to Austria to Hungary to France. A lot of this, and in the United States itself, right? These are Russian talking points a lot of people want to hear. And the one is the diversity of civilizations. Part of the Washington consensus was global consumer society, right? No religion, no nation, 
no local attachments, you are a digital nomad or you're an actual nomad and you consume, consume, consume and we're all happy all the time, right? This message has not played well, right? And what we are seeing is across the world, people value religion, they value culture, they, there are traditional values, you know, surprise, surprise. And this is where I think some of the more aggressive messaging from the West has fallen on, not just deaf ears, but is being interpreted as cultural imperialism, right? Um, the diversity of civilization, traditional culture reimagined, right? So, I mean, think of Saudi Arabia where they have a very dynamic visionary prince who's done away with the morality police and wants women to participate, but they're not throwing Islam away anytime soon, right? So traditional culture reimagined can be an enormous source of strength and a way to bring people together and we know that power flows from the gathering of human beings, for good or for bad. Religion is a source of majoritarian identity, um, which is hard for people in the West to imagine, um, but actually not so hard. I saw it in my lifetime, India going from a very aggressively secular country into a Hindu majoritarian country, right? And I think a lot of Indians feel their identity was suppressed, and any time you try and suppress an identity, it's going to bubble back. Um, and so I'm not going to go through all of these, but there's a strong push to assimilate minorities, a strong uh, push against immigration, a strong push against the sexual revolution, and against sexual identities. And I find that very interesting because, for example, in India, um, trans people have been a very valued part of Hinduism because our spiritual experiences, you approach God, not through your gender identity, by getting rid of it. But they are horrified by the medical surgeries, right? So there are some ways that the consumer framing of some of these messages are really horrifying people around the world. Okay. Um, I'll go through this, I think this is something most people know, is that Russia produces the things that we need in our daily life, right? They don't, um, they produce vast amounts of food, 50% of the world food is produced in Russia. They produce oil, right? They produce fertilizers. They produce natural gas, they produce plutonium that powers the American nuclear industry. We have continued to import plutonium and titanium from Russia through the sanctions, and this is also something that's very weird that why we didn't know this. So for, the, for the, what the rest of the world has seen, and we've seen this in America, is inflation. You look, see what's happening to Europe with the absence of cheap Russian gas and oil. Germany is contracting, England has contracted, um, um, but think, so the German government spent, EU spent up to a trillion dollars subsidizing rising energy prices. Think of a country like Pakistan, where when the price of petroleum doubles or wheat prices double, do poor people not eat? Do they not to, uh, to get anywhere? So I think we have utterly discounted the terrible impact this war has had on the rest of the world, right? Um, places like Egypt, across Africa, where inflation is really eating away at uh, precarious middle classness, right? Um, and that is something we simply, in our fight for democracy, we've, we haven't paid attention to it. Um, what Russia has done is, of course, um, India has done, we'll buy cheap Russian oil and we'll mark it up and we'll sell it back to Europe, right? Um, and we'll buy cheap Russian diesel and we'll mark it up and we'll sell it back to Europe, right? Lots of countries are doing that. Everybody is making money. Um, some people are making money more blatantly than others, but our sanctions regime hasn't worked the way it was intended, right? And I think inflation is going down in the United States and most of you perhaps don't feel it, but where I teach at Cal State Los Angeles, my students feel it. Uh, when price of gas goes up to $6, they feel it. They can't come to school. So something, again, I think we should be a little more sensitive 
in our own country. Um, I have a few countries there that have helped Russia evade uh, sanctions. I could put many, many, many more up there, right? If I was to really getting into the naming and shaming. Many European countries are actively involved in sanction evasion. Many, many European firms, you know, Greece, for example, their tankers are being used to send Russian oil to India. So everybody has a finger in this in trying to break, break sanctions. And then what I feel is perhaps, and I, not just me, a lot of economists are worrying about it, is people are rethinking the dollar-dominated world order. It's not going to happen anytime soon. 60% of all transactions are in dollars. But if it drops from 67% to 50%, we'll start feeling it in our living standards, right? Interest rates have gone up, how much? In the last two years. Um, and that has something to do with the way that the new global economy is being rejigged. So for example, um, Russia and India are doing trade in, in rupees. India is taking that oil, selling it to Bangladesh in their rupees. You see, so it has a cascading effect, right? China and UAE has replaced the dollar when China is buying oil from the UAE. They are buying it in renminbi. And China has been really pushing for the de-dollarization of the world economy very aggressively. They're also unloading American securities at a very fast rate. And that's a little scary because they are, most of our debt belongs to China, right? So if China decides to dump our debt, we are in very big trouble. <laughs> Um, this is an alphabet soup up there. I'm not going to go through it. I just want to say how many friends Russia has and how many multilateral organizations are the part of. The only one I'm going to talk, to, uh, talk about is BRICS. And BRICS might become much bigger. We'll see how the diplomatic negotiations work out. But BRICS, just by the grouping, and I'll show you the map of BRICS, um, if it, is, if it is enlarged, I mean, the Argentinian elections will tell us whether Argentina will join BRICS or not. But Saudi Arabia is joining BRICS, Ethiopia is joining BRICS, right? Indonesia might not join BRICS. So this is a guessing game. Um, but BRICS now, as it stands, is now the same as G7, if not bigger. Right? So we keep talking about the G7, but if the BRICS are substantially bigger, then we are looking at a very different world order that we should be paying a little <laughs> more attention to. Okay. Um, and I'm on my uh, a quick uh, last few slides. Um, Russian military technology, with all the doom and gloom um, that we've been seeing in the press, it, they didn't perform well in the beginning. They're performing pretty well now. And what, what Russia can do because of its economy, they can keep fighting this war and producing ammunition at a rate that we can't, which is a little bit of a sobering thought. Russia also has all these uh, arms companies. So you know, I recently found out about Brahmos. It stands for Brahmaputra and Moskva, the two rivers, Russia and India. This is not in the news. This is an aerospace company. Russian technology, Indian manufacturing, and they're selling it to Malaysia and Indonesia, right? These are not the things that make the headlines, but Russia has military agreements with many, many countries, and the scariest one is, of course, now China. We know that China is supplying Russia with everything, from microchips to semiconductors to arms technology, because Russia is giving it cheap oil. Russia has pivoted entirely away from Europe to Asia. So the one thing that China lacked was cheap energy. Well, now they have it in, in abundance, amazing abundance, right? Okay. Um, and the last one, and again, this was little research I did, is many countries are now creating very small nuclear power plants because you know, they were very expensive and now they have much smaller nuclear reactors. And it seems that Russia is setting them up across the globe. So it's not just food, it's not just shared grievances against the West, 
it's also culture and it is also technology, right? And I think, and maybe I'm just scaring myself uh, through this whole talk. <laughs> okay, so, so this is my last slide, right? And this is where I think there's a lot that we can all do. One is, I'm not those people who think that the West is declining. I'm a very proud immigrant to this country. Uh, my children grew up here. Um, I don't think the West is declining anytime soon, right? Geopolitical narratives take a very long time to emerge. As a historian, I know that, and Yush knows that, right? Um, and sometimes when the narrative emerges, it might be reflecting subterranean shifts, right, that have been happening for a long time. And who knows, in the next two weeks before the fall comes, Ukraine might have a very successful counteroffensive. The people of Russia might rise up and overthrow Putin. And maybe this whole talk will have been completely pointless and meaningless, right? <laughs> and, I, and I am absolutely fine with that, right? So I'm, I am not making any grandiose predictions. I am just sharing some of my research, which offers different ways. And I, do, I don't know if you all have been paying attention to the recent G20 that was hand, held in New Delhi, where Zelensky was not invited where the Ukraine war did not hijack the entire meeting like it did in Bali last year, and that the wording did not include Russia as the aggressor. And the only thing that the G20 declaration said, we want peace. We want the peace as soon as possible because countries are suffering from high oil and energy and food prices and global debt is becoming unbearable. So that was a huge shift. And the only reason that happened, I think, because the EU and, and uh, the United States allowed the statement in realization of this emerging world order. Okay, um, and what is, the, what is my responsibility as a historian? And I'll tell you, I've been terribly Eurocentric my whole life. I was fascinated by Russia, fascinated by Russian-American relations. And in my last book, I sort of addressed my own ignorance about Russia in world history. And what I would say to my field is, we better get to know the rest, right? We better get to know the global south, and we better think of ways of incorporating them into the world history, because I think this is where Russia is a little bit ahead of us, but we're very smart, we'll catch up, so. <laughs> That's it, thank you very much.